Compared to the rest of Central America, Honduras was once a sea of tranquility. It was poor, but saw no vicious civil wars or massive inequality. This, however, began to change in the middle of the 20th century and now faces severe security and institutional problems. To see why, join me for this brief explainer on the history and politics of Honduras. The first European to encounter Honduran land was Christopher Columbus when he landed near Trujillo on August 14, 1502. Incidentally, also the first time a European set foot on the American mainland. Columbus recognized the potential of the place as a deep harbor and called the area the Bay of Honduras, or Depths. Lured by gold, colonization followed swiftly in the 1530s. Its metal load was important enough that they even located the capital of Central America in the western side of present-day Honduras, at the town of Gracias. The mining efforts also increased the demand for indigenous slave labor. Native Hondurans had long resisted Spanish invasion and enslavement, and in 1537, a young Lenca chief named Lempira led an indigenous uprising against the Spanish. Inspired by Lempira's example, revolt swept the western region, and the Spanish were very nearly expelled. But Lempira was assassinated at peace talks arranged with the Spanish in 1538, and the native resistance was soon quelled. A cycle of smaller revolts and brutal repression followed, decimating the native population. Enslaved Africans were introduced in the 1540s to fill the growing labor shortage. Mining sustained the colony for the remainder of the century, but a collapse of silver prices and the constant challenges of excavating such rugged terrain devastated the Honduran economy. The revolts and mining crisis led to the loss of status for Gracias, and in 1549, the capital for the Audiencia was moved to Guatemala. Meanwhile, cattle and tobacco enterprises gained some traction in Honduras, and a change in the Spanish throne in the early 1700s reduced corruption and helped revive the mining industry. However, another upheaval in Spanish rule in 1808, when Napoleon installed one of his own on the Spanish throne, sparked revolts on both sides of the Atlantic, which irreparably damaged Spanish colonial rule. As a result, Honduras, along with the rest of Central America, declared itself independent from Spain on September 15, 1821. The country then followed the rest of Central America, except for Panama and Belize, first into a short-lived union with the Mexican Empire in 1821, and then into a federation known as the Federal Republic of Central America. The new republic faced enormous challenges rooted in geography, ideological differences, and weak government capacity, and was soon enmeshed in civil wars that would eventually lead to its dissolution. In that internal conflict, one Honduran in particular came to embody the dream of a united republic, Francisco Morazan. Born in Tegucigalpa, he came to prominence as a result of his victory in 1827 at the Battle of La Trinidad, a clash against federal troops where he was outnumbered over two to one. The triumph paved the way for him becoming the head of state, that is, governor of Honduras, first, and later president of the Central American Republic. He and his liberal allies held the union together for a decade, but in the end, the ideological disagreements between him and conservatives were too much, and the capacity of the state was too little. On November 15, 1838, Honduras officially left the Union. The pro-church conservatives in Honduras took control under Francisco Ferreira, who became the first constitutional president on January 1, 1841. During the mid-19th century, despite its declaration of sovereignty, Honduras supported efforts to restore the Central American Union a fact still illustrated by the Honduran flag, whose stars represent the former member states of the Central American Union. After 1871, the ascendancy of Justo Rufino Barrios in Guatemala influenced a return to liberalism in Honduras, where Marco Aurelio Soto, a liberal ally educated in Guatemala, assumed the presidency in 1876. Soto sought to improve lines of communication and mail service, including building some railroads, a telegraph system, and launched an unprecedented education program in the country. He also moved the capital from Comayagua to Tegucigalpa in 1880 and attempted to bring foreign investment into the country. In the 1880s, the New York and Honduras Rosario Mining Company revived Honduras' promising but underdeveloped mining industry. The company enjoyed almost unfettered and untaxed access to the ore rich mountains near the town of El Rosario, east of Tegucigalpa. Despite its decades of operation and after the extraction of an estimated $100 million in minerals, however, Honduras as a whole would see little to no benefit. 
It would not be the only foreign operation with that record. In 1899, the United Fruit Company began its operations in Honduras. In the following decades, especially once it came under the leadership of Samuel Samure, a Russian-American, bananas would become the largest export for the Central American country, by far. And the company, along with the United States, would repeatedly intervene in Honduran domestic affairs, thus leading to the coining of the term Banana Republic. In 1908, for instance, Samurai financed an invasion from El Salvador that tried to take down President Miguel R. Davila. It didn't succeed, but it exemplified just how weak and unstable the government was. Indeed, Davila himself had led previous rebellions and had been put in place by the U.S. military as a compromise choice after a previous invasion from Nicaragua had prompted a small civil war that threatened American interests. Around this time, the two political parties that would shape Honduran politics for the next century were founded, both a formal institutionalization of liberal conservative divisions that had existed since independence. The first was the Liberal Party of Honduras, founded in 1891. It has been mostly in the center of the political spectrum, but over the years has had left and right factions. It has elected slightly over half the president since then. The second was the National Party of Honduras, a more conservative outfit, which in theory is based on Christian humanism. It was founded in 1902 by Manuel Bonilla. The height of power for the National Party during this period came in 1932, when following political turmoil and economic upheaval caused by the Great Depression, Tiburcio Carillas Andino was elected. He would go on to rule the country for the next 17 years, the longest any one individual has ruled Honduras. Carillas has strengthened the armed forces, thus gaining favor with banana companies by opposing strikes and with foreign governments by strictly adhering to debt payments. He also consolidated his own power, outlawing the Honduran Communist Party and restricting the press. The Honduran Constitution did not allow re-election, so Carillas had it amended, extending the presidential term from four to six years. He ruled that way until 1949, when he was pressured to give up power to his Minister of Defense, Juan Manuel Galvez. Up until this point, Honduras had remained the poorest country in Central America, and although it suffered from instability, there was also less violence and upheaval compared to its neighbors. Three reasons account for this. The privileged class in Honduras was smaller because coffee exports did not flourish until after World War II. Foreigners rather than Hondurans developed its commercial banana production and did so while displacing few peasants or indigenous communities because the industry evolved along the sparsely populated northern coast. In fact, though generally poor in quality, land was nearly always plentiful. Land concentration began only in the 1950s. This had several repercussions. First, absent an angry, dispossessed, and exploited rural working class, the army remained weak well into the 20th century. Second, the banana industry shaped labor relations differently than in neighboring nations. Because banana companies were foreign-owned, Honduran governments were not as interested in suppressing banana workers' wages. Moreover, because banana production was less labor-intensive than coffee production, companies felt they could pay higher wages without becoming less competitive. Strikes were frequent, but Honduran governments felt less inclined to forcibly suppress workers. Thus, banana companies made wage concessions more easily in Honduras than in other countries or other crops. The strength of the organized working class became particularly evident when in 1954 a general strike against the United Fruit Company led to a substantial increase after just 69 days and to a more responsive government well into the 1970s. It was around this time, though, that Honduras began a path more comparable to its neighbors as the military became more enmeshed in the country's politics. First, it carried out a coup in 1956 against Julio Lozano Diaz, a vice president who was only supposed to temporarily fill the role of president, tried to keep himself in power. Second, it made sure that when a new constitution was ratified in 1957, the new constitutional top military authority was a general, not the president. During its first coup, the military permitted new elections to go ahead almost immediately. Not so in 1963 when it toppled another president, 10 days before the next presidential election. This time, Air Force Colonel Lopez Arellano suspended elections for two years, then ran himself and won. During this time, the regime began to repress labor and peasant activism and to enlarge and strengthen the armed forces. Lopez Arellano also presided over the so-called Soccer War in 1969. 
The roots of the hostility were complex. During the 1950s and 1960s, El Salvador's flagging economy and severe overpopulation had led as many as 300,000 Salvadorans to cross illegally into Honduras in search of work and arable land. The Honduran economy declined in the same period, and Honduras began to blame Salvadoran immigrants for stealing jobs and depressing wages. In June 1969, Honduras announced it would begin expelling illegal Salvadoran immigrants. Hundreds were deported and many thousands left on their own accord. Honduran media continued the blame game, while Salvadoran reports alleged abuse by Honduran police and immigration officers. That same month, by chance, the two countries were playing in a qualifying match for the 1970 Mexico World Cup. At the game, which was played in San Salvador, Salvadoran fans attacked Hondurans and destroyed and ridiculed the Honduran flag and anthem. Back in Honduras, angry Hondurans assaulted Salvadorans on the streets. Tension soared, and on July 14th, El Salvador invaded its neighbor. Its troops penetrated several kilometers into Honduran territory, while Honduras responded with airstrikes, destroying military installations and oil and gas storage tanks. The war lasted just four days. Around 2,000 people died, mostly Honduran civilians, and as many as 100,000 Salvadorans fled or were expelled. Relations between the countries took years to mend, and in many ways never have. The official peace treaty wasn't ratified until 1980. Relations between the two countries were tested again not long thereafter when El Salvador erupted into civil war, bringing fresh waves of refugees across the border into Honduras. Meanwhile, López Arellano served a full six-year term, notable for his authoritarian excess and disregard for bureaucratic process. He stepped aside for civilian elections in 1971, only to be reinstalled a year later following yet another military coup. A succession of military leaders, each as corrupt and ineffective as the last, ruled the country from 1972 to 1981. By the late 1970s, corruption scandals, deepening economic difficulties, and the fall of the Somoza regime in Nicaragua, and pressures from spurned civilian politicians created powerful incentives for the military to abandon power. Although the Carter administration never severed military assistance to Honduras, it pressured General Paz Garcia to relinquish power. Yielding to that, the military in 1980 called elections for a constituent assembly to rewrite the constitution. In November 1981, presidential elections were held. Honduras' era of military rule was over. During the 1980s, Honduras found itself surrounded on all sides by political upheaval and popular uprisings. Civil wars raged in El Salvador and Guatemala and in Nicaragua. The Somoza dictatorship was overthrown by Sandinista rebels in 1979 its guardsmen fleeing across the border into Honduras. Of course, the U.S. had a powerful interest in keeping Honduras stable. The U.S. viewed Honduras as a crucial battleground in its effort to halt the so-called domino effect and the spread of communism in the Americas. Economic aid poured into Honduras, quickly making it one of the top 10 recipients of U.S. military and economic aid. In return, the U.S. used Honduras as a staging ground for counterinsurgency efforts throughout the region. Nicaraguan refugee camps in Honduras were used as bases for U.S.-sponsored undeclared covert war against the Sandinista government, which became known as the Contra War. At the same time, the U.S. was training the Salvadoran military at Salvadoran refugee camps inside Honduras. Economic aid slowed local opposition, but it wasn't long before Honduras began agitating against U.S. militarization in their country. In reply, military commanders ordered the kidnapping and killing of hundreds of opposition and student leaders, a first for Honduras. The tactic backfired, swelling the ranks of demonstrators and alienating many in the military establishment. In March 1984, the military's pro-American commander was removed by force by his fellow officers. General Walter Lopez Reyes was appointed the successor and the Honduran government promptly announced it would re-examine U.S. military presence in the country. In August 1984, it suspended U.S. training of Salvadoran military within its borders, and then, when the Iran-Contra scandal hit, it refused to renew a new military agreement with the U.S. That, coupled with the election of Violeta Chamorro as president of Nicaragua in 1990, put a final end to the Contra war and their presence in Honduras. Elections in 1989 ushered in Rafael Leonardo Callejas Romero of the National Party, the first time in 57 years that an opposition government had taken office peacefully. Callejas had promised to keep the Lempira stable, 
Instead, during his tenure, it lost three-fourths of its value. Prices rose dramatically to keep pace with the U.S. dollar, but salaries lagged behind. Severe economic and financial decline allowed the liberals to sweep back into power in 1994 with Carlos Roberto Reina, whose conciliatory approach did not solve all of the nation's problems, but nevertheless gained him wider support than Callejas had enjoyed, and the liberals were able to win again in November 1997. The new president, Carlos Flores Facuse, an engineer with close ties to the United States, represented the more conservative wing of the Liberal Party and promised to continue the pro-business policies of his predecessors. In October 1998, however, Hurricane Mitch, one of the worst storms to strike the Western Hemisphere in recorded history, caused massive damage to the country. It killed several thousand Hondurans, displaced in excess of a million persons, ruined the country's economy and infrastructure, and caused widespread misery and unemployment. Despite the economic and social challenges, there were two more peaceful transfers of power between the liberals and nationals, and it seemed like Honduras' political system was finally maturing. And then, Manuel Zelaya, a cowboy hat-wearing rancher from Olancho, came along. There was some progress under him. Extreme poverty was reduced. But when he tried to have a national referendum which would have allowed him to revise the constitution and serve a second presidential term, the military ousted him. Something the National Congress and the Supreme Court both supported as they saw the referendum as unconstitutional. And in late May, the court had explicitly declared it illegal. So on June 28, 2009, Zelaya was forced onto a plane, still in his pajamas, and sent to Costa Rica. The National Congress then proceeded to vote him out of office and transferred power to the next person in line, Congressional Leader Roberto Micheletti, as acting president. The international community quickly condemned the ouster, including the UN and the Obama administration. Pressure from the international community, however, changed little. Attempts at a negotiation led by Oscar Arias dragged on, especially when Zelaya sneaked back into the country and took residence at the Brazilian embassy in Tegucigalpa. A deal was finally reached between U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and acting President Micheletti that would allow Zelaya to serve the last three months of his presidency, but because this required Zelaya to recognize the scheduled 2009 elections, he refused. And that was that. The 2009 election saw the election of Porfirio Lobo, a member of the National Party. Under Lobo, there was some success at political reconciliation but there was little progress with regard to social problems, particularly drug trafficking, which had been growing exponentially since the early 2000s. Then things got worse under Juan Orlando Hernandez, who was elected in 2013. There were several scandals, like the indicting of drug trafficking and money laundering of one of his government's former ministers, Yankel Rosenthal, as well as the accusation of illegal financing of the president's campaign. Also, at the end of his term, a prominent environmental activist, Berta Cáceres, was murdered by a known assailant in her home, later connected to the owners of one of the projects she was supposed to, and apparently with the tacit approval of the Honduran government. This caused massive protest in a sense that complete impunity ruled the country. Even worse, institutionally speaking, after the whole Zelaya debacle, he convinced the country's Supreme Court to declare the non-reelection clause in the Constitution to be declared unconstitutional. And so Hernandez was allowed to run for re-election in 2017. That election was full of irregularities. The most suspicious of all was that at first Hernandez's opponent was winning, but as the results were reported, the electoral tribunal suspended reporting those and then finally announced Hernandez as the winner. What the majority of Hondurans saw clearly was fraud. This led to massive protests, which led to the killing of at least seven people. In the end, Hernandez survived, but he is only more in battle now. His brother has been convicted for drug trafficking in the U.S. and sentenced to life in prison. The same might yet await the current president as his term ends in 2021. For most of its early history, Honduras had managed to limit violence and the power of the army, even in the face of massive poverty. It did less well with foreign intervention, especially from the U.S. But even then, it was not as disastrous as its neighbors. This began to change in the 1950s as the military opted to topple several governments. And while it looked like it was finally consolidating its democracy after the 1981 transition, recently there has been much backsliding 
beginning with the coup against Zelaya in 2009. This has worsened under Hernandez, and it remains to be seen whether corruption can be curved somewhat. Right now, that seems unlikely.